basics with the business. Uh, I want to take a, a minute or two to introduce our first speaker, John Seymour. John has been keeping me since he was, he, he said since he was this old. <laughs> his granddad and his dad taught were his first teachers uh, when, it, when it comes to beekeeping. Um, and he kept bees at a time when, in the good old days, when things were a lot easier in terms of keeping bees. He never needed to do any kind of treatments. He just didn't need to. The bees just did their thing and very hands off. Um, he got married in 1968, his wife Ruth, who is also a, a pretty sharp beekeeper in her, in her own right, uh, and continued beekeeping. About six years ago, um, John started working a little bit with Don Fat Bee Man, Kuchemeister, I don't know if you've heard of him. He is a uh, organic commercial beekeeper in Georgia. Um, and Don started teaching John some of the commercial aspects of beekeeping, how to work with sending out packages and, and, and stuff like that. So, so John and Don have a relationship there. Maybe someday we get Don to come up here. Um, I personally met John about three years ago when I ordered bees from, from his company. His company is Wolf Creek Aviaries. They're based in Centerville, Tennessee. Um, and I found them online and I knew that I wanted small cell bees. So I called up John and Ruth and ordered some, some bees from them my first year. Uh, I will say a few things. The bees are extremely gentle, hardworking, and, and they're survivors. And I think, you know, having talked to John a lot, I, I think that kind of comes down from him. Because that's sort of the kind of guy he is. Um, he's extremely generous and kind with his advice, especially to a uh, new beekeeper like myself at the time and still now. Um, for example, uh, the time when I was installing a, a package and, and getting everything set up and putting the queen in, oh, oh there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> I called John and Ruth in a panic. They, they, they talked me down and, and calmly said that everything's going to be all right. We'll take care of you, Adam. And, and, and they did. They got me a new queen in the mail immediately and, and everything was okay. They talked me step by step on, through what to do. And, so, just very uh, helpful and, and, and generous kind of guy, and he's full of stories. <clears throat> I remember a phone conversation. I got him talking about some stories, and one that stuck in my mind was he told me about a, a new beekeeper who, who got the three-pound package of bees and thought that the bees could live in that package oh. and just stay there. He didn't have to do anything with them. Oh. So that was that was a good one. He got a million other ones. Um, <laughs> So, uh, one last thing, a, a couple years ago, I remember saying on, on the phone to him, today's the first time I've met him in person, oh, John, someday we'll, we'll get you to come up to Philadelphia and talk to our bee club. I was kind of joking about it. Well, here he is today. He made the drive from Tennessee yesterday, and welcome John Seymour. child concerning bees. We grew up on a farm and it was a very old farm down in our family uh, when Tennessee was still part of North Carolina. And uh, one of the first memories of uh, dealing with bees would be we had so many bees back then that uh, when we went outside as a child and of course back then you know every kid in the country went barefoot and you would have to walk on the sides of your feet because that, that's a little bit harder for, uh, for a bee to sting into, and if it stung you, it wouldn't hurt as if it was the arch. And so you'd walk across the yard hoping not to get stung. That's how many bees uh, we had back then. But unfortunately, today we don't have that. And it's a result of uh, 
our own undoing, thinking we know better than nature itself. What we try to do is get people to work with nature, understand nature, and working in, with nature you will have uh, better success. And they've been around here a long time, and they know what they want and need. So we encourage you to look at these in a little bit different um, view than, than what you have perhaps in the past, and try to work with nature, not, not against nature. Uh, one thing that um, I've been blessed uh, to, to work with uh, uh, Don, he's an excellent beekeeper. He will teach you things that's unbelievable about uh, the commercial, commercial aspect of beekeeping. If you ever get down to Lula, Georgia, it's well worth your time to uh, take one of his courses. He makes uh, wax, handmade wax. He has a wax milling machine. He can show you how to do that if you're in, into making your own wax. That way you don't get a lot of chemicals. Unfortunately, there's very few companies out there now that offers wax that's not really contaminated. Not the best company we run across is Barks TTL out of Barks Kentucky. They take and get their wax from out in the Dakotas of Montana, where out there they have a little bit different system of beekeeping. They take and go out there and start every year fresh with fresh packages. They put them in, feed them, get them to draw the wax out, and it's cheaper to extract the honey, shake the bees off in the fall, melt the wax down, and send the packages back down south than to feed them over the winter. Uh, because honey is, I don't know what y'all get for honey up here, but I understand it's quite a bit more than what we do. Uh, but it's, uh, it's cheaper to feed them the, the uh, sugar water in spring to get them to draw out the wax and try to keep enough honey on them that cold climate out there in Montana. And so Kelly White gets there with most of their wax from there. And so it has those chemicals. And we've had really good success with it. Uh, one thing that you beekeepers need to understand, this happened uh, down south, that if you get into beekeeping because you think that it'd be a great place to hide money, <laughs> uh, this is a true story. Uh, this is back in 74, 73. The gentleman had $18,000. And uh, back then, uh, the styles changed a little bit slower down there than, than other parts of the country. And his wife had a beehive hair I don't know. Some of y'all wouldn't even know what it was, but the older people would remember it. He kind of stuck up that high and the hairspray and everything. Every time she'd go outside, the bees would just come and check that hair out. And uh, because of the uh, perfume uh, hairspray she uh, used. And as a result, she actually hated his bees. So he thought, you know, hey, this would be a good place to hide my money. We're having difficult times. So he went down the bank and pulled out $18,000. Today, that's about $84,000. Put it in the beehive. Three or four weeks went by. He went out there to the yard and checked the bees. What in the world? He found green confetti out there. The bees were chewing up his money and putting it out. If it doesn't belong in the beehive, the bees will get it out. So don't think you're going to hide your money in the beehive. And, uh, but uh, they eventually uh, ironed out their differences, but they're a little bit... Uh, not as well off as they would work. <laughs> now, uh, something about beekeeping is that unfortunately we, we have uh, stories that have been passed along like um, a, a bee brush. You know, everybody know what this is? A lot of people call them bee agitators. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe perhaps we're not using it correctly. Maybe we've been taught wrong. If you'll look at a frame uh, that's drawn out, you notice the cells are put in at a 45 degree angle. All right, that's for a reason. They do everything for a reason. They just don't go willy nilly around. You know, we'll try it this way this week or this way next. So they draw those cells out, and that holds the uh, nectar in so the moisture can evaporate, evaporate. And as a result, if you learn to use that technology that they've come up with, 
take that frame instead of brushing down like this, you're breaking those little girls' backs because they got their heads stuck in that cell cleaning it out. Well, you're brushing it, you're going to make them mad. So if you learn to work with nature, take that frame, turn it upside down. Now the cells are pointing downward and out so that when you brush, you're, you're gently pulling them out so they won't get bent out of shape. And so that a, a, will be a real big help to you in, in dealing with your beads if you use a brush. Another thing that we've all been told is that if you have beads over there and you want them over here, you have to take them and move them two miles away, keep them a little while, and then bring them from back here. That's not correct. You can take, move those beads right there to right here the same day. But the trick to it is understanding the beads. The little girls have a three-day memory. And so if you go in one evening, right before dark, take a piece of screen wire, screen off the front of the hive, pick it up, and move it over here, keep them boxed up to the evening of the fourth day. I like to do it on the evening of the fourth day. That way it's totally gone. Pull that uh, screen off, and the bees never go back. By using what they want, to be treated by, by thinking about it, giving them what they need when they need it. Uh, one thing we found that um, is with I grew up using 10 frame tubes, and my granddad in his day they had 12 frame jumbos, which are 14 inches deep. Uh, I have a honey would weigh about 145 to 100. 30, I mean, uh, 130 to 145 pounds, somewhere there pounds. So it's quite heavy. <laughs> then when my dad came along, they were already cut down to that standard, what you see today, it doesn't do like that, but 10 frame. And when I was growing up, it didn't matter because you would just pick the frame up, and, uh, number one and number 10, and move it toward the, toward the center, and get them to draw down. Well, today with high beetles, it's a different story. The high bills is one of the things we received in the uh, world trade. And as a result, if you have 10 frames, and bees naturally draw out about eight frames, six to eight frames. And so number one frame, they don't particularly care about drawing it out. They may draw one side, but the outside is really open high beetle territory. And so they will become a, a nuisance to you. Are y'all having trouble with high beetles up here? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, if you don't have them, they will come. It's just a way, the way it works. And by taking and reducing the size of the hive down to eight frames, we've taken all of our hives, virtually all of our hives, we've got a few ten frames left, but they're all mediums. And by reducing it down, it puts more bees into a concentrated area and less places for the beetles to be. A beetle is a pollen beetle, actually, and it figured out a long time ago, a lot easier to steal pollen than it is to bring in. And so they will come into your hives uh, down in Ashland City, Tennessee. It got so bad down there, it looked like a swarm of bees would come in the hives. And they would take and use a tray on a screen bottom board, very similar to this, and. Um, at that time, the guy was using the best wall, and within 48 hours, they had over 600 high beetles that they counted in, in that tray. So it's uh, like anything else, it's a location, location. If you keep your hives out in the sun, beetles have to have a 5% moisture content in the ground for them to uh, pupate. And so by reducing that, it helps with the high beetles. Also using lime dust or diatomaceous earth scattered around the hive and underneath the hive. And if you want to put it down just right before rain or water it in, don't be like a boy down my way. He decided, you know, for some reason other people have the mentality of if a little bit's okay, a whole lot more will be great. So he took 50 pounds of uh, diatomaceous earth and dusted around three hives 
in the high set up on a hill. And he called and, and, and I went down there to look at his feet, helped him out a little bit. I drove up and I said, what in the world? You know, it was a big glow on the side of the hill. We got up there and, then, and I said, what's this? He says, well, it's time to make some surgery. He told me to put it around the high, but not thinking that he would take and dump 50 pounds. So don't use 50 pounds because he got a wet, hardened over, and it's perfectly useless. And when you use diatomaceous earth, you want to use a food grade or a feed grade. It's available at our farmer's co ops or uh, some farm uh, supply company will get it for you. Don't use a garden grade because it's a little bit coarser, uh, it doesn't seem to get in the joints as well. And uh, certainly don't use the uh, swimming pool grade because of the heat treated and changes the molecular structure. So as the temperature rises, so does the population of bees. They, uh, beetles. They quit producing about 50 degrees. And then as it gets on up about uh, 64 degrees, 86% uh, of them will hatch out. And then when you get up to 86 degrees, 90. 6% will hatch out. And it only takes uh, 10 high beetles to burn a high. 10 female. One female can lay 200 eggs a day. And if you have 10, that's 2,000 eggs a day. Times 7. So you can see how that will really add up in this time over 14,000 high beetles running around. And high beetles come in different colors. And the reason for that is when they first hatch out, you may see a little red-looking bud. Uh, and on the slides a little later on, we'll see a high beetle. But they can be red when they first hatch out. And it depends on the amount of pollen available to them, they will be in different sizes. Sometimes they will be quite large, and then other times they'll be a little bit smaller. And, and um, I don't know if we can pass it around, but uh, for those who haven't seen a high beetle, I've got a uh, okay. I'm gonna catch it. Y'all just pass that around, that gives you an idea of what they look like if you haven't seen one. But there's natural ways of dealing with them. And uh, one, one thing that Don taught me, and uh, hopefully it will save you from paying a stupid tax. I paid a lot of stupid taxes in my life. And one of the things that Don taught me, and which I thought was really cool, was I've always carried a high tool. Uh, there's various types, but um, if you carry one of these that has the hook for scraping, it's a, it's a good tool. So when you carry that high tool, and especially after you get to the point where you have out yards, I never dreamed that Ruth and I would be doing this. I retired uh, 10 years ago, and I wasn't going to do anything. I was just going to hunt and fish. But, <laughs> but uh, I'd have a few bees, and people would uh, come by and uh, run off the road nearly, because we lived kind of in curve. They'd be watching, and next thing you know, they'd be over in the ditch. And it started aggravating us about bees, and we sold a few packages, and then I started looking around uh, for someone to help me the commercial end of it, because it's quite different than than keeping bees. So I went to Don, the fat bee man, and one of the first things he told me about a hive tool, it can be your friend or your enemy, especially when you have outlying yards. So you need to learn how to put it in your, your, your pocket. So if you take and put it in like this into your pocket, you get in your truck or your car, guess what? You're going to cut your seat all up. And mama's not going to be happy. <laughs> so if you'll take and always face the hook to you, you'll never tear your seat in your car or your truck. So that'll save you some of that stupid tax. And uh, so I've been, like I said, I've been very fortunate to have people in my life to help me to uh, keep from paying stupid tax. And uh, so there's one of the other things I encourage you to think about right now. I see a lot of young people here who are in good health. But sooner or later, nature takes over, and as you get older, the hives will become heavier. So I encourage you to use a frame medium for two reasons. One, it standardizes your equipment. Because if you get outlying yards and you have to go 
to those yards, but it never fails. I'd be out there, I'd be one box short. Whatever, it didn't matter. It always worked out. You'd be one box short, and you'd have to go all the way back to the house, and then all the way back over. So if you have a one box system, you'll always have either a honey super or a brood chamber. So it's just so much easier to operate in that way. And also, there's only two types of beekeepers. Those with bad backs and those who are going to get them. If you do bees long enough, you will get bad back. And so by using the eight frame mediums, it will help reduce the chance. And it's so important that a lot of your major honey producing companies now have gone, of course they use 10 frames, gone to 10 frame mediums because of reduced worker's injury. So it will help you in the long run. Uh, so if you have just getting started in beekeeping and you have deeps, you can cut them down, you'll lose a little bit of the frames, but that's a whole lot better than paying seven to eighty thousand dollars for a back operation. And so I encourage you to think about that because you will get older. When I was a kid I didn't think I might be here. But unfortunately um, but and then again fortunately I am here. And uh, the nice thing about uh, using three eight frame mediums, that gives you about three quarters of an inch more of a honey band on top of the, uh, the hive. That hive is constructed, constructed as a dome shape. If you took a bowl, turned it upside down, the top of that hive is, is dome shaped as far as regard to the, to the brood. They build up and then kind of tall in the center and as they get toward the outside it drops down and so by having a larger honey band it's less of a chance of that queen crossing it by increasing it it tells her oh we don't need to be up here this is our honey storage so they'll move back down and very seldom you'll get a queen that um, will cross it and lay up there and so it's a it, it's just a matter of learning to work with nature and you'll have better success with your bees. We're, our first talk was about small sale. And the way I got started in small sale was that I had no idea about different sizes of you know, sale structure on honeybees. I thought the bees that I'd raised up on them were the honeybees, they were natural. Well, it turns out they weren't. And so the way we got started is that uh, one of the farmers in our community sold his farm, he had had bees. And he had a stainless steel extractor, and I needed another one. And so I got hooked to Neil. We went out there and looked at it. And uh, we liked it, and we made a deal. And on the way out, to the back to the truck, you know, said, hey, I got some bees down yonder in the corner that uh, I had about eight years ago in the hide hide from the uh, road line. And uh, he said, you're welcome to them if you want them. I hadn't put anything on them and treated them. They were either going to make it or not because uh, he was so disgusted trying to keep bees with the road lights and the uh, trailer lights coming in. And so I went down there and took a look at them, looked, looked at them and found that uh, they were in good shape, but there was something different. Of course, you know, wax moths clean up the hive and then over a period of time, that's nature's way of getting the hollow tree ready for another set of bees to come in. And so they had already done their thing and damaged as much as they possibly could and got it cleaned up. And these bees had drawn the wax out in the frames. 90% of the frames were just as nice drawn out as they could be. A couple of them, because the frames were kind of cockeyed, I think there was one frame missing out of a box. And that frame was cockeyed, so they drew it out kind of any guy there. And um, I pulled them up and looked at them, did disease inspection, no diseases. And I took and um, I said something was different, but I couldn't put my finger on it. So we loaded them up that evening, took them to the house, to a yard that we had away from the house, so that uh, just in case they had anything, we didn't want to bring it into our bees. So the next meeting of our big keeper club, we, my wife went out there with me. She had a big Ziploc bag, and I pulled a frame out, and shook the bees off, and set it down in there. Don't ever bring your, your equipment uh, to a bee meeting 
that um, you know just open it up and pass it around. I always enclose it in something because if you're not sure what you've got, you don't want to give it to your other beekeepers. And, and American Foulbrood spores can live 30 or 40 years, they say. I've never seen it, and I hope and pray I never do. But uh, she opened the bag, I set it down in there, and she sealed it. And then the next meeting, I took it to the club. At that club, I'm very fortunate, this is one of the other guys, uh, Joe Sides, that's come into my life. He's an excellent beekeeper, but he's one of those beekeepers that will not tell you nothing unless you ask. And he will tell you everything. <laughs> And uh, he is a really knowledgeable individual. And that, at that point, he told me that's what I had was the natural size B. And I said, okay, natural size. I got those at the house. At the house. No, those have been artificially large. And that started us on our, our beekeeping course of uh, having the honeybees now that we didn't. We've never put chemicals on our bees, but it was a constant fight. The Amish in our community told us that if you took uh, men leaves and just threw them at the top of the hive, that would take care of the trachea mites. Because some of their kin people had a large men farm, and none of their bees had trachea mites. So we did that. That worked good. Then the grow mite came in. That devastated a, a large percentage of what we had. Uh, then the hives that we noticed that with the old German black bee descendants, now those bees are mean and nasty, but they produce a ton of honey for them. If you can work them. And we still have the wild feral uh, bees in, in, in our area of Tennessee. University of Arkansas did a uh, DNA test on bees from different states, and they found that uh, all the bees were not killed out by the tracheal mites. Of all the wild feral bees and the um, uh, grow mites didn't kill them out. So there are still wild feral bees to be found. So we'll go on here and talk about the um, uh, small cell bees. Hopefully I can pull this back up. Okay. You know, they're, they're just like the other bees, except they're smaller in size. And uh, like all of these, I just assumed that they were uh, native to the United States, but they weren't. They were brought here in the uh, late 1500s and uh, on into the early 1600s. And they were the, the first bees introduced in this country were the German blacks, which I mentioned earlier. They were great honey producers, uh, but they were mean and nasty, and still are mean and nasty, and uh, it's hard, very hard to work with them. They fell out of... Uh, Dominance in the 1850s when the Italians came over. At that point, uh, from that point on, they just um, pretty much, I don't know if anybody actually keeps them uh, in a commercial stream. And uh, the worker sale prior to 1893 were 4.9 millimeters in diameter. And the first available artificial foundation was made in Germany. And as far back as uh, 1842. The thinking was that, you know, a bigger bee could haul more honey. Well, there's been a lot of tinkering with bees in 1891. There was an experiment even to take and to shrink it from 4.9. And of course, you're cramming a bee down structurally, its body has to change. Whereas if you enlarge that cell, it stretches to a certain extent, kind of like a rubber band. And uh, the, the shrinkage really failed uh, because the bees are really grumpy and mean, hard to deal with. Uh, A.I. Root uh, was the first one who made a successful machine to make foundation. And uh, he made the standard size, what we today call the standard of 5.4. Uh, and, and it worked real well for 93 years because back then when I was a kid and growing up in beekeeping, there was no treatment for bees. The beekeeping industry was the last industry in the agriculture field to use um, pesticides and um, petrochemical products. And why they're not working now? Well, because of the tracheal mites. 
The Traco mites were first discovered in 1984, and they're, uh, it's hard to imagine another bug small enough to get inside of a, a bee's throat and, and choke it to death, basically what it does, cuts the hair off. And then, of course, uh, varroa mites were found in 1987. And a varroa mite, uh, I don't know if y'all have them up here, but down home we have little, little ticks. They call them seed ticks, and that's what they put you in mind of. They're little blood suckers. And, um, you know, one of the outcomes of using the artificial large feed is that a large percentage of our um, sources of nectar are little bitty tiny plants, especially early on. Right now, down south, we're having things bloom out. Up to that point, uh, up to about two weeks ago, you could take a bee pollen substitute to build, uh, start getting things ready to go. But they won't touch the pollen substitute now because of little bitty tiny, little bitty flowers are blooming. Uh, one thing about pollen substitute, USDA has uh, up the limits of neonicotinoids, which is a systemic pesticide that is found in soybean meal. And in doing so, you could wind up getting in trouble and putting a poison on your bees. Man Lake has come out with their Ultra B, which is 95% crude protein. Uh, it has the uh, no soybean meal in it. And it's a plant derived product. It has all the amino acids in it and the uh, vitamin B, uh, several different minerals in there also. And it seems to work. We thought we'd try it this year. They love it. The bees are doing good on it. Uh, this is the first year we've ever done anything like that, but I just thought I'd try it just to see how it would work. But once the nectar, I mean, once the pollen, natural pollen is available, they will not touch it. So, when they enlarge the bees, there's a lot of small flowers, and some of the first flowers that bloom are your little bitty tiny ones. And the muscles, the black muscles of the um, 5.4 bees, it's just like a rubber band. You put it around your fingers and open it up. That's what happened to the muscle structure. They didn't get more muscle, they just stretched it. And that's the reason why the European bees are having a hard time being taken over by the Africanized bees. The Africanized bees are 4.9. And as a result, it's like comparing a uh, 5.4 as being a big bomber and a 4.9 bee, a drone, uh, being the fighter jet. Who's going to get there first to the plane? The fighter jet or the bomber? Of course, the fighter jet. Will. And so that's one way they take over the European colonies is through replacing the queen through mating with, with her and getting the uh, European genes out of the situation. And uh, of course the um, the 5.4B has a larger trachea tube. As a result, another bug inside that chokes them to death. And the 5.4 row mites love to breed in the drone because it's a much larger cell. They can do multiple breedings in there. And with it being a larger cell, not only <coughs> they breed in the worker cells, whereas before it was just strictly the drone cells. And um, they have, uh, unfortunately, because of the mites, it seems like the bees that uh, get the mites, they'll have a, um, a secondary disease, such as a lot of the um, viruses. And that virus, problem is because of us as beekeeper or, or the industry has bred bees since 1970 to not produce as much pollen. Propolis. Propolis is an antibacterial, antifungal substance that the bees coat their hives with. And um, so by taking and reducing that, it helped get the frames out. Back when I was a kid, it was quite difficult to get the frames out. And a lot of things that happen in beekeeping industry is for the commercial beekeeper. And by reducing the amount of propolis, it made it quicker so they could go through the hives. And we're reaping those, not rewards, but we're reaping the so-called benefits of uh, 
commercialization of beekeeping. And the capping time, uh, from the time uh, a 5.4 bee B is laid, is about nine days after the egg is um, laid. That, um, in other words, it, it creates a longer time for the hive uh, row might get in there. And, it, and it's up to 21 days after the egg is laid, it will emerge. And if you notice, the little seed tip looking things. Okay, if you look, you can see right there, that's on the back of the bee. Right there, they, that's usually where you'll find them, or under their abdomen, right there. You notice this is a drone, see how much larger that eye is? That's a drone, and they, look at the number of mites, one, two, three, four, five, five mites. Whereas if it's a worker cell, it wouldn't be quite as many. Well, why the natural cycle? Well, because uh, the nat these bees were designed, or have evolved, however you want to say it, uh, to, to take care of their, their hives in, a, in a, such a fashion that it's uh, production, they're able to do everything in a, in a, in a manner in which benefits the hive and, and carrying on their genes. And so they're able to get into the smaller flowers. Their flight muscles are more dense so they can fly faster. And of course, they have a smaller trachea too. And the mites basically will only breed in the drone cell. And they reduce the secondary diseases due to uh, not having such a high mite level. And the capping time for 4.9 bees is 8 days instead of the uh, uh, longer period uh, of the larger cell. It, it emerges in, a uh, worker uh, will emerge in 19 days instead of the usual 21. And um, small cell bees, you have more cells per frame. And uh, on a medium, give you an idea how many more cells of worker cells you'll have, you'll have 520 more on a medium foundation than you would on a uh, large cell frame of medium. And so it's a number of bees that make the honey. I'd rather have one colony of 60,000 bees than two colonies of 30,000 because the colony with the 60,000 bees, it's a concerted effort. It's a winning combination there. It's kind of like a football game, you know, when, when the team is winning, everybody's up and doing, doing real good. And, but when they start to lose, you know, they can lose confidence. And you only have a hive of 30,000 bees. They're not as confident as a hive of 60,000 bees. And this is a kind of a, a club right here on the part of uh, Jennifer. Uh, she's a very knowledgeable beekeeper. She's got some good bees, too. Um, they put an article out about uh, small cell really doesn't work. And then later on they put an article in February of 2009 in Bee Culture Magazine talking about wax. And so she was looking for wax to do a study on. And so she had to have the baseline that had no chemicals in it. So she went to Brazil because down there they have Africanized bees. And because they have Africanized bees, which are 4.9, they do not have to treat for mites. So something on that study is not quite right there. So by going to Brazil to get the wax, because they don't treat, they don't have that apostan and check mite in there, but unfortunately, they had some other chemicals in there that she couldn't use for her study. And when you go to comparing the 4.9 bees to the 5.4, You'll see uh, they have more floor so sources and muscles are more dense, smaller tracheal tube. The drones only breed in the, the drones. And that's one thing that um, a lot of people will like to draw out natural wax, and I'm all for that. But do it in your honey seekers. If you can keep your drone population to manageable, you won't have as many mites by using the worker drone foundation. And of course, uh, secondary diseases 
the virus is going to be a problem because it just seems to come along with the varroa mite. Faster calving time, and of course, back, faster hatching time. Plus, you have more cells per frame. So it's a it's worked real well for us. And uh, but unfortunately, there's no silver bullet in beekeeping, and that's um, one of the downsides of our society. We all look for the silver bullet, the one shot to uh, go to the doctor to get fixed up, and you got to feel take care of this. Well, it doesn't work. There is no silver bullet in beekeeping. It's a combination of things. If you'll learn to keep your genetics of your bees fresh and different um, from different sources, we constantly bring in uh, queens for evaluations from throughout the country uh, to see how they'll do in our region to see if they're all really what people say they are and we do it for a two year program and by that time the second year you can really tell whether or not uh, it's a flu or what and uh, one of the things that we do besides genetics we use spring bottom boards and I encourage you to use green bottom boards because it mimics nature. Because bees build up in a hollow tree. That's their natural cavity is a, is a tree. And all the debris falls down. But the nice thing about all the debris falls down, there's ants in the bottom of the old trees. And they'll haul everything out to their cavity and fill it. Uh, they have parts of wax and things like that. Actually, they don't eat wax. Pollen, I mean, pollen. Uh, one thing about uh, wax, the only thing you can eat that is moth, the wax moth. And uh, by using the, the natural size sale, the spring bottom boards, and if you use powdered sugar, we, we recommend that you make your own powdered sugar. You take a blender, and I encourage you to get your own equipment because you can get in the doghouse using wine. Um, they're very territorial for some reason though. I'll give you an example. This is this is what happened to us years ago. I read an article back in the early 70s in um, organic gardening. And we were having a little bit of trouble with potato bugs. So um, I went to the garden and the article said if you take them, go to the garden, get her you up a bunch and then grind them in some water and then you can take and strain them and spray them on them. Uh, the uh, potatoes, and that will scare away the other bugs because they, they smell death. It's just like human beings. When you have been in a situation where you have to go into a room and you smell death, you don't want to go in that room again. And so uh, it was a Saturday evening. Uh, Ricky had gone to a store. And it's a 90 mile round trip uh, to go to the store where we live. And so I said, all right. So I ran in the house, got her blender. Filled it full of a cup of water and then filled it full of these bugs and they turned it on and man I really whipped them good. <laughs> but unfortunately it was too big for the sprayer, so I was like, what the world could I use to strain this? Got the bright idea. Went to her lingerie drawer for our pantyhose. Pantyhose is the best filter in the world. So I strained it through. And this is on Saturday afternoon. Well, made two mistakes. One, I didn't clean the blender up. I just set it on the counter. <laughs> and needless to say, uh, but it did work. The process did work. Take a bug. But um, she turned me in and seen this mess in the, on the counter there. And all the bugs ground up and it's, uh, I got chewed out about that. Well, I didn't tell her nothing about the pantyhose. <laughs> <laughs> I got this made now. Well, Sunday morning comes, she wants to get dressed. She runs into her drawer, and she forgot to buy a pair of pantyhose. And she couldn't find a pair of pantyhose, and she just immediately turned and looked at me and said, what did you do with my pantyhose? <laughs> so, I encourage you guys, uh, get your own equipment. <laughs> It'll save you a lot of um, discomfort. Mama's not happy, nobody's happy. So that, and that actually happened to us. And so from that point on, uh, every now and then I will slip up. And, but for the most part, I kind of have my own uh, cooking.
cooking utensils as far as working with the babies. And of course, the herbal treatments, um, such as um, lemongrass salt and tea tree oil so will help your bees. Everything we use on our bees, uh, the bees work naturally. And uh, the bottom line is to work with nature and, and not against it. And of course, we have become a society that we're dependent on chemicals and, and they have failed us. This is something of interest as in far as working with, with nature. And if it wasn't important, bees would not do it. So by learning this, and, and this is where Don and I disagree, he, he throws his brains in there, it doesn't matter. But if you want your foundation to draw out really smooth, just as pretty as it can be, if you'll take your foundation, and if you'll notice in the bottom that, that foundation, drawn out foundation, uh, manufactured type, and even in natural size, uh, you will see a white in the bottom of that cell where these three plates come together to form the bottom of the cell. Well, if you turn that frame 180 degrees around, you will find that that Y is now upside down. So if you always put that Y to the inside of your hive, you will find that the foundation will be smoother and almost, it's unbelievable how slick it will be. And so if it wasn't important, they wouldn't do it. So they got five frames. If you're using five frames, you face it upside down line this way. Uh, most manufacturers, if you use a wedge top uh, bar to hold the wax foundation in, if you have the vertical hooks, they will take and put um, that hook toward the inside of the hive. So you just feel that uh, frame wedge, you'll know that, that goes to the center. If not, take your pencil and mark down one side on the edge on each end a little mark so that you'll be able to see what goes to the inside. It'll save you a lot of time and trouble. If you don't believe this will make a smooth foundation, take your hive and try it. See if it doesn't work. And that's something I encourage people to do. Is get out there, try it, take your hive, try things on it. You hear something? Well, think about what you're hearing. One thing I encourage people not to do, especially up here, is some of the books you'll read about installing queens. And they'll tell you, just take the queen cage, lay it in the bottom, on the bottom board. Well, these cluster, and cluster, to hang. And if you put her on the bottom and it turns cold, the bee's not going to get around her. And she, she'll chew on and you'll have a, a damaged queen. So always suspend your queen from the top. Don't put her on the bottom because it's difficult for the bees to cluster and <coughs> the queen on the bottom. We had people last year that read a book, and I don't even know the title of the book, but uh, they were talking about how to install a package. But that's fine if you're in Florida. But in Pennsylvania, don't do it. So look at the author, find out where he's coming from before you make any decisions about um, how, how to go about doing things. So if uh, you have any questions, you can call Trevor uh, over at Long Island Springs, or you can call us. Uh, sometimes I'm not in, we um, I take a message, and we will call you back, it may be a day or two, but uh, we will call you back. So. Because we don't want you to make a, you pay the stupid tax because we've done just about everything uh, that you can do wrong to bees. And so that's the reason why I went to Don to learn about the commercial aspect of bee people. So I think we're going to go on to the... Oh, all right. Uh, Uh, we have a website, uh, just in case you didn't get the handout, organic treatments, you can download it, and it's a PDF file. There's another, uh, like a calendar, a uh, beekeeping calendar for the uh, different uh, months of the year, so you would just have to rework it for your agriculture zone. It's also uh, brochures, John's 
company has broken floors. As you can see, I'm not real sharp on computers. My wife's a lady that handles that at our house. And uh, the one thing about uh, using natural treatments, you need to know. You need to know what you have. And to diagnose the problem, you need to understand. It. No semen is probably one of the major causes. Of, of colonies to, to die. If you'll notice, now these are pretty bad cases, but they were chosen so that you can see it's fecal matter out on the high and on the top of the frame. And it's a fungal disease. So you have your, your bees are doing okay, you don't have no problems. But your bees go out to a flower or one of the side effects of having this fungal diseases that bees will throw up on top of the flowers. And as a result, the bees will bring those semen spores back to your colony and infect your colony. So we encourage you to treat your bees twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall. And uh, one thing about no semen, we've got it on our uh, printout, is that tea tree oil it's one of the best fungicides, natural fungicides available. The honey that the bees produce from this tree is the only honey that's USDA certified to be used on diabetic sores and wound victims because of the high concentration of hydrogen peroxide. When antibiotics won't work, uh, they use that to uh, get people on burn victims. I've seen pictures of burning victims, third degree burns, and they put that honey on there. It's really amazing how little scarring that the individual will have. But of course, they will change colors. The skin will be pink when it turns cold. One of my boys um, was burnt one, one time. He was a young man, and uh, we had to go through that burn hospital, and it's, it's pretty tough. And the one spot that we missed was behind his ear. And uh, you, you, that's the only spot he uh, was scarred because I just overlooked it. And we had to scrub him down with uh, a solution they gave us. And it was pretty tough. So don't play with fire like he did. Uh, then you'll find that uh, the uh, feces on the walls of the hive, the bottom board, and the outside. Now, this is different than when you get a package and you install it. If you get a package out of ship to you, uh, the bees are will not use a bathroom in the cage and, until about 10 days. And then after that, they just can't hold it any longer. And so you may find a, a little bit on the front of the hive when they come out to the fly, they've got to go real bad. But it's elongated. Whereas if you notice, these are splotches. And uh, there's quite a big difference between that and bees flying out. Uh, you'll see bees crawling aimlessly on the bottom boards. And the colony were really looking uh, reckless. Uh, they, they're restless, so they don't have a real clear direction. And then may even get to the point where you'll see quivering or trembling. And maybe even see advanced stages of paralyzed legs. Uh, flying will become and of course the wings will be kind of cocked in a different uh, normal position. Their stomachs will be swollen. And the mid-gut, if you take and pull it apart, will be of a dullish grayish white uh, color. And the ring, the mid-gut section will have actual rings around it in a healthy bee. So if you want to know what a bee looks like, you pull it apart, pull the head off, pull the mid-gut out, and you'll see that the uh, healthy bee will have rings around the, uh, the gut. And for no semen, the use of tea tree oil. We use it once in the spring and once in the fall. 
And the way that you use the tea tree oil for no semen, you take a mixture of uh, water and a cup of water and put it in a blender, your own blender, not your wife's, uh, because it will leave a, a, a taste in it. Uh, I got caught a couple of months back. My wife drinks a uh, shake protein drink in the morning. And uh, I don't want to go out to the bee shit. I'm just mixing up a little small batch and some bees. And it was um, lemongrass oil. So I put it in there and mixed it up. And I washed it really good, I thought. Put it in the dishwasher and washed it. And then she used it. And then she knew immediately I'd been in there. So get your own. Uh, you take about a half a cup of water or a cup and, and pour it in a glass jar blender. And then add your teaspoon of tea tree oil to it and blend it on low for four or five minutes. This is extremely important. If you run it on high, all you're going to achieve is the oil thrown to the top of the blender. And by using a smaller amount, a half a cup to a cup, the oil stays down around it top of the water, and as it blended for that four or five minutes, it takes and emulsifies it. And in our area, um, we're probably known more or less in our county and in the state of Tennessee for good whiskey. And it's uh, illegal type. And uh, because of the high quality of water we have. And with uh, that, everybody's got fruit jars now. If you can find your old half gallon fruit jar, it will have uh, eight cup measurements on the side. And this is an easy way of, of mixing your, your treatments. So if you take that cup of, of uh, water and, and uh, the uh, tea tree oil and put it in that eight cup jar and then fill the rest of it up with seven cups of water, you've got enough treatments to do your high um, seven times. You take one gallon of that, of sugar water, and put a cup of the tea tree oil mixture in there and feed it to the bees. And you want to make sure they get that whole eight cups to that sick high. If, if you do have no semen, it will appear it because it's a natural fungicide. The next thing is for the treatment of chalk root. Chalk root is a really mummifying of the uh, root. You'll notice that the cells will be, you open them up, or actually the bees will start trying to remove them and they'll be just a little hard mummies uh, in there. And it's also a fungal disease. It can be controlled through uh, use of uh, tea tree oil. Uh, you can find this, uh, it's more prevalent in years where we have a wet spring. But you know, before 1970, this really wasn't a major disease because before 1970, the breeders weren't tinkering with the amount of propolis that the bees made. But around 1970, they started breeding this out. And it's a fungus that infects the uh, gut of the larvae. And it competes with the food. And as it's competing, it just kind of dries the thing out. And so eventually the larvae will starve to death. The bodies become mummified and can be seen in the cells on the bottom boards where the bees are trying to pull them out and out on the ground. The tree, of course, back to the tea tree oil. And if you'll look go online or look in our uh, <coughs> website, you'll see that uh, there's at least two gallons of syrup for the colony that's infected. And another way of doing it is to replace the queen with a more hygienic type of uh, genes in there. And remove all your old frames of pollen. It seems like the fungus grows more so on the, the pollen. And ideally, to move your hives to where they'll get uh, sun, full sun, to about 3, 3.30 in the evening. Now, European fowl root, I've never seen this. I uh, hope I don't. Uh, not because I want to go blind, but I just don't want to see it. This uh, is a browning of the larvae. And you'll notice a regular healthy larvae, someone like that. But this is a sick one. It will be a brown, brown looking in color. And uh, it's a 
bacteria. And they are lightish to uh, a cream gray, grayish looking brown. And as they die, they start darkening. And if you look at it in the early stages, it will be a uh, regular twisted possession of position of the bee larvae. And you can see it in the bottom of the scale. To uh, find out if you have, if it's not American fowl root, you take a like an American fowl root. Now there, it's not gone awful ugly like root. So if you're not, if you see this, the best thing to do is call your bee, come out and look at it. And the treatment is of course by the hygiene. And that and keeping bees natural. You want to be and they sense that something's not right, they'll pull it out and get rid of it quick before it spreads. But uh, it's best to call your bee it's different. If you'll notice, the sails are, will be wet looking, kind of looking, and they'll be concave in the, instead of flat top. And when you... And when you take and use a match, Punch it, push it in the hole, and you see how far that pulls out? It's quite a ways. And then when it, you pull it out a little bit further, it's it's real stringy. And of course, it's a, a bacterium also. You'll find uh, it has a irregular root pattern in stem. instead of being compact. The larvae has been dead for a long time. It will be extremely difficult for the bees to pull out because they just kind of get slimed in there. And um, of course, they'll, they'll be larvae will be light brown to dark brown and not upright, but not twisted in the cell. See, that's a giveaway point right there. Whereas with European, they have a twist to them. And um, compare it to healthy larvae, uh, healthy, moist, and wet, and greasy looking, then dry. Caps will be concave, and a lot of times you'll find them with holes in it, they tell them, where the bees are attempting to remove the dead. And the smell is awful. And number seven, and this is very important, it's very contagious. And um, it's uh, bees that demonstrate hygienic behavior. But you really need to call your bee inspector if you think you have it. And in our state, all hives are required to be burnt. And I encourage you, do not ever buy used boxes. And the reason for that is, this is what happened in our, our uh, state. About 190 miles from us, um, a family had bees. My grandpa had them. Well, the great grandkids come along, they decided they wanted bees. And so they were given the hives. They cleaned the hives up, painted them, got them all looking nice, and then took and um, kept what they wanted and sold the rest in a three county area. As a result, they did not realize that Grandpa's bees died from American fowl breed. Those spores can live for 20 to 40 years, some people say. And as a result, the state came in and burned 52 hives because they hadn't been infected by American fowl breeds because the equipment had been used and the individuals that uh, put it out on the market did not know that um, it could be uh, have disease in it. And uh, all metal tools can be put in the oven. They need to reach about 130, 140 degrees, and then that will kill it. And gloves and clothing needs to be, and a bee, bee suit needs to be uh, burned. Now this uh, little jewel right here is the grow line. That is the seed tip of the bee. And if you'll notice, <coughs> Roll my little wheel has on. Um, one of the uh, visible signs, of course, are, and you won't see this until they get a large number of this in your colony, is that you can actually see the bees on the, uh, the, the body of the bees. You can see the CT of the roll line. And you'll find a deformed, uh, deforming of the legs and wings. Uh, bees being discarded out in front of the hive. If you have a hygienic hive, they will take pull them out. Uh, you'll see it, and you'll start seeing uh, when they pull them out. You'll actually see the the uh, rope line on there, spotty brood pattern. Bees 
are a pale, the mites rather, are a palish, uh, reddish, brownish in color, and um, they, they're quite too easy to see when they're on the uh, pupa. And the treatment for mites, of course, is the use of drum cone. And the thing about drum cone is a very effective way of treatment, but you've got to stay on top of it. Because when you set it in there, the bees dry off the wax, and then they start laying the eggs, when he lays the eggs for drums, and then the mites attach to it. Once they catch it, you need to pull it out right away. Because if you continue to leave it in there, you get busy doing something else, and you forget about it, uh, you're going to have a bunch of mites. And one easy way to keep up with spraying your drums is if you take a thumbtack and push it in on top of the frame. That's an easy way to take and, and be able to identify which is the drums. Yeah. And you want to pull it out, put it in the freezer 48 hours. We like to take and um, uh, take a stainless steel scratching tool that you use to extract honey with, run across the top. It just makes it a little bit easier for the bees to remove the uh, dead leaves. Now, if you're a fisherman, uh, that's uh, when they get in camp like that and you wait a, just a little bit longer, maybe a couple of days more, and they start making a real good fishing bait. Down south, that's what we use for fishing bait, the drums. And uh, of course, you use a 4.9 of these, uh, sugar dusting. And when you make your sugar dusting, we encourage you to take and use uh, just household sugar, four ounces per box, put it in a blender, Turned on low. Do not turn it on high because if you turn it on high, it's going to, uh, you can scorch it. And the bees, uh, as a grooming, they will not be able to digest it. And of course, this right here is what's interesting. It has been out since 1996. And it's a great way to kill mites. But, and there's no money in it, there's no silver bullet to sell you. You ever wondered why we've gotten that way? Think about this. When you have high blood pressure, you go to the doctor and you talk to the doctor and he says, we can treat your high blood pressure. You have sugar diabetes? We can treat your sugar diabetes. You'll never hear anything from your doctor about cure. And the reason for that is Back in the 50s, the last thing the medical field has ever cured was polio. And it put so many people out of work, they figured, oh, we don't need to do this again. And so it's now, it's treatment. How can we treat it? Well, this is a cure. This will, this will stop your rolling But it needs to, and the reason we don't tell you exactly how to do it, and we don't tell you how to do it on our, our sheet here, is that once again, as human beings, we think a little bit, we had a whole lot more, we'd be a lot better. Well, if you put a whole lot more, you can actually kill your bees. There's a natural threshold there. And if you get too less, the nice thing about getting too less of the winter green oil is that the bees uh, that do have mites uh, in the cells, that those mites will not reach maturity uh, sexually. And so it interferes with that. And of course, lace wing virus is a direct result, or the form wing virus is a direct result of uh, drug mites. And if you notice, those little wings are like they have set. And uh, you'll find them crawling around on the ground in front of the hive because the little girls can't fly. They have disjointed wings, they're deformed, and uh, the adults will be uh, disfigured. We have come up with a um, natural essential oil mixture that you mix this into one gallon of sugar water and feed it to each colony that's infected. And um, it's very effective. It's a three-part mixture that um, we've played with uh, over a period of time to, to get it right. Now this is the high beetle. This is the pollen beetle that we were talking about earlier. This is a mature pollen beetle and it's a hard shell and it's split down the center and has wings. They can fly and some
some people say up to five to 20 miles. They can smell a colony in, in distress uh, that's being attacked by other hybrids. This is what they look like in comparison. Now these are full grown with plenty of pollen for them to eat on. Who knows how big they are compared to the honeybees. The black, it's a black beetle seen running around. Usually when you open your lid, you'll find them uh, on top of the hive. And adult males will deposit eggs and masses in any of the little crevices. They'll tunnel through the combs and as they tunnel through, they will take and uh, defecate in it and it causes fermentation. I don't know if y'all have fire ants up here, but uh, we have. And to save the cones, you can actually place the fire ant, uh, the cones on the fire ant hill, and they will clean it up. But they will not utilize it and have good, uh, good wax. And um, the small high beetle is a larvae that uh, feeds on the pollen and through the hive. Uh, for about six to uh, for 10 to 16 days and all that's depending on the weather and the amount of pollen available and then they will actually crawl out and keep the soil and to show you how determined they are to get uh, Joe Sides went to a house a lady complained she had uh, bees in the wall in the basement they went there but they were infested with high bees to the point where they were just larvae were just falling out and the lady thought they were baby baby bees. So Joe put these uh, sticky board traps and in the basement was 60 foot long and he placed them out there and those high beetles would crawl and of course as they would get the board would get full more would crawl over the top eventually would get to the door. They were trying to get to the door and that's how many high beetles was in that wall. And um, of course, the size of the beetle will vary due to the amount of pollen they have to eat. And like we talked about earlier, it will be a reddish in color when they first hatch out. And unfortunately, they can live up to six months. They will eat cantaloupe, uh, uh, pumpkins. They will winter over and you have a lot of uh, strawberries. They will winter over in strawberries. And so the best thing to do is uh, keep them out in the sun. And better beetle blaster is a real good trap. Do y'all, is anybody familiar with that trap? All right, what it is, it's a trap that's put out from a beekeeper down in Florida. And it's basically like this. It's a clear plastic trap. They're selling as disposable trap. What we do, uh, it's recommended you put all that. And if you have oil and it never fails, you put a quarter inch of oil in it, you sit this down, it's going to fall over. It's going to spill oil everywhere. So what we do, we use hyd uh, hydrated lime. You can buy 50 pounds for $8 down our way. We take put a quarter of lime dust in the bottom of this trap okay? and place it in the hive. Or the outside of the colony. And the reason for that is there's less bees out there. And when you put it in, you want to put it to the outside back where it's the darkest. Less bees are out there. And if that toward the front, the bee space has not been changed. You want this down flush, the only place it's been changed is toward the back. And by keeping it flat, the bees will chase the beetle in there and up and over into the trap. The beetle gets its feet, uh, little suction cups with the um, dust on them and can't crawl back up. The down use of one of these traps is that three to four weeks you need to go in there, pull it out, take it, turn it upside down, tap it, and empty it. And the reason for that is as the beetles start to die off, they start to decay and they start stinking. And the other high beetles can smell it. And so they wait from this area where there's no to be dead. So you want to, want to remember to always keep them clean. You them out uh, or you can dispose of them if it's done. If they get bent to where they're not usable. This is another trial. This is AJ Beetle. Beetle Beetle, really. If you use this trap, 
need to take and get you some bread ties and tie, tie it together. Because if you don't, you go pulling it up, it'll come apart and your oil will leak all over the house. So if you use this, you need bread ties. It's like five bucks if you buy hundreds. So they're quite reasonable. If you buy just a few, I think they're under about $1.50. And it's a very good to take care of the beetles. <coughs> the, um, uh, the use of cortex trap. This um, is something that I mean, and we use it um, also, but we've taken it a little bit to a different level. Whereas with um, Don, you take and use the political signs. That's what it is. It's the, um, the message isn't that good anymore. And of course, the, you take and you cut them up into little squares or rectangles. And they're two and a half by four inches. And when you do that, you want to make sure the two the tubes are on the ends that is um, a two and a half inch way. Take you about six of them, take you some Crisco, seal this, flip them over, and put two teaspoons and seal it with Crisco. Take one of them and place it on the bottom of the screen bottom. Just right at the back, about three quarters. Well, what that has, what that causes is a runway for the beetles. They love Crisco or any kind of shortening. The older the better. Once again, use your own knife. And they will eat their way into that Crisco and then will eat boric acid. These things last about three, three, four months. Depends on your infestation of beetles. Well, what we did, we took the step that's as they come in the hive. So we thought, well, let's take this a little bit further and protect each level of the box. So what we did, we took and cut, going the long ways of two and seven eighths, with the holes going this way, and inch and three eighths. Why? That inch and three eighths now is just the right size for sitting on the frame on top of the frame. We staple it down, right there just past the shoulders. We put it on the right front of the box, and then we take another one and put it on the left rear. So opposite of each other. And then as we go to each box, we stagger. Go back and forth, so come back and forth. That way you have high beetle coverage throughout the hive. This is very effective. Bees cannot get to the propolis, I mean to the um, uh, boric acid. We use a pharmaceutical grade boric acid, and the bees um, haven't had any, any problem with it. This is the only thing we use in our hive that is not, um, that work naturally. Fred Ross, a couple of years ago, it's a trap. Basic same idea, he calls it the beetle barn. They put up, sell for about $2. Uh, do not use flipper nail. You may see on the internet that uh, people using flipper nail. Flipper nail is a roach uh, substance. To uh, it will kill high beetles, but it does outgas into your hive. Use it. It's, uh, it's not a group that will cause your bees some issues down the road. And uh, the main thing is to put your hives out in full sun. They need that sun to keep the soil dry so that the uh, beetles won't be able to pupate. And of course, wax moths. This uh, the wax moths in comparison to the size of the bee. This is the, uh, the larvae. And the signs are that you'll see in the bottom, if you look into the bottom of the frame, the be tunnels dug in there. Kind of like a mold. It looks like a mold. And as it advances, you'll start seeing silken crisscrosses through the um, uh, high frame. And when you get to that stage, you'll start seeing dark 
little particles in those. Those are uh, excrements from the uh, wax moth, and that will, when it gets to that much, uh, over with. And then, the, of course, the silk and cocoon will attach itself to all the wooden parts, and actually will eat into the, the wood. And the, the treatment is to take all your frames with the tunnels in them and place in a freezer for 48 hours. And what that does, it kills that, that larvae that's in there. And that, we're talking about frames that are still useful, don't have the, uh, the uh, uh, webbing on it, just the tunnels. And then take you a 10% solution of bleach water, one frames. And what you're trying to do is get rid of that smell, as much of that smell as possible from the uh, moth. Let it dry and then put it into a real strong hive. That way you can save your, your, your wax. And you don't want to put a whole bunch of it into one particular hive because that just attracts more wax moth. And uh, the cones that uh, have the uh, silken trails in them, the webbing, cut them out and melt them down. And to save the bees, kill the old queen. That's your problem is the old queen that maybe she's become a role where where you pull the frame out one thing to remember there is a, and he shows him going to a beehive pull that frame right out looking for well when you do that it's great for my business because you're going to roll your queen though it doesn't kill her it's going to damage her ovaries and all of a sudden you notice there's less and less bees and that's a result she has a large pheromone smell and she still smells good these will not draw out queen cell. Not laying that many eggs because she's still drawing smell, but her ovaries are not because of damage. Uh, and of course, you want to uh, put your sheet of newspaper down on good strong colony. Can get a queen. Put the sugar down. Set you an empty box on top. Shape all, and then before you do that, take your knife and cut you about three or four slits in the newspaper running between the frames, uh, and then. Shake all the bees off into that empty box and put uh, them in there and then put a, a feeder on there and feed them because they have no, nothing. You might want to put them in there. But what will happen is they'll be so excited about getting that paper out. And again, if it doesn't belong in the hive, they're going to drag it out. And so the bees from below will come up, start taking it out, then everybody has a work effort um, of their the way they are, they'll get it and combine the colony together. And so if you've got some uh, the boxes are still good, you can wash them down in a 10 solution of bleach water and of course uh, rinse them off and let them out. This main thing is to keep a strong, productive clean. You won't have to, uh, of course, trachea mites. Talk a little bit about those. These are Actually, bugs in the trachea too. And that's what they look like. And your sign just walking around, bees not being able to fly, very hard to detect without dissection. And in our state, we can send them to the state and they will dissect it for you. And usually it's about um, three to four weeks in treatment before it off. You can apply that. The thing about applying it, you, there's a threshold. Uh, if it's uh, over 80 degrees, you can take and uh, place it on the bottom board because menthol evaporates and goes up. If it's below, you want to place it on top of the frame so that that smell will go out the bottom of the hive. And it works best between 60 and 95 degrees. And of course, uh, a new that shows tracheal mite resistance is the best way to do it. And uh, so back to that again. So if y'all have any questions, you can kind of give us a call. But uh, how are we looking on time? Okay. Still got five minutes. Uh, 25 minutes still. Okay. I'm going to show you a few things that um, we picked up and how, how we worked.